Good morning, Vision Church. Thank you for joining us today, either in person or online. In just a minute or two, we begin our service. But before we do, I want to let you know about two ways you can help us. First, if you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or on the Vision app, please share this video on your feed or send the link to some friends. You can never know who could be blessed by worshiping God and hearing the gospel today. And you can help them by sharing us with them. Our mission is to glorify God and make disciples. Our goal is to make disciples here in our local community and all around the world. If you believe in our mission and want to help us achieve it, you can partner with us by giving to the church. You can give to our website, visionrdu.com, and look for the giving page, or you can download the Vision RDU app and give there. Again, thank you so much for joining us as we worship God this morning. Let's prepare our hearts to praise God, and as our service begins right now. Good morning, Vision family. How's everybody doing this morning? All right, now, I, I know this is the first early service, but um, I'm going to need y'all to give a little bit more up for the resurrection of our King Jesus. So uh, can, we, can we get a good morning? How y'all doing this morning? Okay, all right. God bless y'all. My name is Roy Dockery. I'm the outreach director here at Vision, and Miss Larisha wanted to let me know, so it's going to be a little different today. Normally, it's a worship team here that'll, that'll get the praise going. Unfortunately, for a few minutes, y'all just get to deal with me. So uh, it's, it's, it's all good. So, um, but yeah, our normal flow of service after that buffer video, we normally write, go right into worship. I know we've got a lot of visitors here today, so we just want to make sure uh, everybody understands that. But please get comfortable, um, see somebody that you don't know, and, uh, and just get ready. So I'm actually going to open this morning with the spoken word piece. Uh, my pastor uh, asked me to, to, to do something, so we're going to start with that this morning. Uh, and again, this piece is called come back soon. Everybody good? God, you knew me before this DNA programmed the demographic details of my physical existence. Our triune God, omnipotent and a community within yourself for from eternity, you were concerned for me and introduced yourself to mortality. Fully aware of every wicked act that would be birthed from our depravity, you chose to seek justice by wrapping your divinity in flesh. Born of a virgin to purge our humanity of generational stains, you went undercover boss walking through the corporation of our confusion. These whitewashed tombs acting as your representatives, pilfering prophets while misreading prophecy to their own benefit. You allowed the weight of a system that you built to press a crown of thorns into your head. They mocked you, suffering the denial of even those who rocked with you, including me. Because see, it's easy to say that we rep the king of kings while surrounding an altar in the presence of others professing. But when we step into the office, we deny you thrice before lunchtime. Because every mention of my weekend neglects bringing attention to this, my time of worship. See, you accepted my guilty plea while fully innocent, and I can't mention you in a casual conversation. I am quick to co-sign their complaints of your bride while hiding my affiliation, and you died for me. I may not have cast lots or thrown stones at Calvary, but I've been complicit in making a mockery of your sacrifice. I will never understand how your love reached out from the grave and took the very power from death. Your resurrection seals an eternal sacrifice, making you our eternal public defender with an immunity deal signed by your blood, but with my name. You loved me. In the midst of my doubt and disbelief, when I was committed to the streets, a liar and a thief, you loved me. When I turned my back on who you called me to be to step into my own constructed identity, you loved me. When death was at the bottom of a bottle or in a chamber connected to a barrel, your finished work on the cross gave me victory in that battle because you loved me. See, you have to note the present tense of that last affection because your present help is my confession because you rose from the grave. See, on that third day when the stone rolled away and the tomb was empty so I can be saved by faith because your grace is sufficient. God, you loved us enough to die. You loved us enough to rise. 
and you love us enough to return to. So please, 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 I pray, Jesus, that you come back. Please come back soon. God bless.
bring it back. Hey. One more time. I want to hear y'all sing it out now that you know it. Hallelujah, here and now. You have turned my life around. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I was lost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, here and now. You have turned my life around. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I was lost, but now I found. Hallelujah, here and now. You have turned my life around. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I was lost, but now I'm found.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. My name is Sean Bynum. I'm one of the pastors here. My wife and I lead the Oneness Ministry. Y'all, I only have one announcement. Well, first, I want to thank everybody who's online. Thank everybody who's in the building. This is 9 o'clock. We are worshiping again at 11. But I have one announcement for you guys. Just one. He is risen. That's it. He is risen. That is it. That is it. This is Resurrection Sunday. We are in the building looking fine as we are today in our Easter outfits. I can't see everybody, but y'all just so pretty out there. Looking all good. Just give yourselves a pat on the back for stepping it up for Jesus today. But he is risen, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out with us. You could have been anywhere in the world, but we're so grateful that you're here today. The Lord is really moving in this place, guys, and this is an amazing opportunity for us to share the love with one another. So at Vision, we say this. We're not like a family. We are not like a family. We are a family. So let's do this fellowship break and tell somebody that you didn't come here with that he is risen and do your thing, y'all. Not too long because we got to move. Not too long. Go on, sit down. Sit down. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, family, family, family. Y'all are sitting down. Praise God for that. Y'all, just like most family, we are a growing family. We are a growing family by God's grace. So like I like to say here in correct English and all, squoze on in. Allow the first-time visitors to have a seat somewhere. And if you are a first-time visitor, thank you for coming out. We are so grateful for you. If you're a first-time visitor, put some praise hands in the online chat, wherever you are, whether it's YouTube or Facebook. Let us know that you're here. We're so grateful that you're here. And if you are a first-time visitor and you have not been to the first-time visitor area, please go about out there. Um, someone is there to meet you. They want to greet you. They want to give you something. We are so grateful for that opportunity. And thank you guys for your obedience and squeezing on in to allow people to enjoy and fellowship with us. Y'all, it is Easter Sunday. <laughs> he is risen. All right. We're going to continue with our worship, turn your eyes to the screen, and um, giving. We have four different ways. You've seen it before, and if you haven't seen it, you can give online. You can text to give. We have a giving box in the back. Guys, let's get it in. Turn your eyes to the screen. God bless you. Good morning, Vision family. Thank you for being here with us, whether you are in person or online. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us today. There are many exciting events coming up, and I want to take just a few minutes to share more about Vision with you. If you are new here, we would love to get to know more about you. All you have to do is scan the QR code on the screen and fill out a Connect card. This card is a great way for us to get your contact information so that we can follow up with you directly and help you find community and fellowship here. Throughout the month of March, we are partnering with No Woman, No Girl again this year to provide essential items to women in need. Donation boxes will be available in the lobby every Sunday in March for you to drop off items like shampoo, conditioner, body wash, body lotion, and hand sanitizer please prayerfully consider how you can donate to help us reach more women with essential items they need. March 31st is the last day you will be able to donate to this initiative. Are you looking for an opportunity to meet our pastors and learn more about Vision? We are having coffee with the pastors immediately after our second service on April 7th. This is a great chance for you to meet our pastors, ask us any questions you want, and fellowship with us. We hope to see you there. You can sign up for all of these events and learn more about what's going on here at Vision by checking out our events page at visionrdu.com forward slash events. We are excited you are here and hope that God has something amazing to say to you today. Have a blessed day, Vision family.
Well, good morning, Vision family. Can we give God some praise in this place? Come on, family. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I see a couple of y'all got it. Can we give God some praise in this place? For he is risen, he is risen indeed. The tomb is empty. And we're celebrating his victory over death, hell, and the grave today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I don't know about you, but I could have got some more of that worship. That, that this is the gospel had me rolling. I burned a couple calories over here this morning. And I'm excited to be here. Well, listen, if this is your first time with us and you're joining us on Resurrection Sunday, I'm Jerome Gay, lead pastor here, one of six pastors here to serve this wonderful body of believers. And we are grateful that you decided to worship with us on Resurrection Sunday. So whether you're in person or at home, we want to say thank you. We do count it a blessing and an honor. And we do hope that this is not your last time. Vision, let's give our guests a big old round of applause. Thank you again. Hope this is not your last time. Do me a favor, get 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read just a few verses. I am ready to preach because I'm excited about the tomb being empty. I'm excited that we get to celebrate this beautiful reality of the greatest comeback of all time. So if you don't mind, stand with me. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 15 verses 54 through 57. We do stand and read the word together. We're reading from the CSB version of the Word of God. I'm going to read and then I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you will pray for me and we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. This is the Word of God. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach about the comeback. Say comeback. Come, come back. Let us pray. Father, we love and praise you. We are thankful for this day, this time, this opportunity to celebrate the beautiful reality of the resurrection, that the tomb is empty that you reign in eternal victory, that condemnation does not apply to those who are in Christ, that if you can feed death, hell, and the grave, we can get through whatever we're going through because you went through. And so, God, I pray now, God, that as we have been able to worship you in song and now we worship you in sermon and we will worship you in sacrament, that you will completely have your way. Uh, we thank and praise you, God. Set me aside. Move me out the way that I would preach under the anointing, the power, and the presence of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Prepare our hearts and minds. God, I, I pray that this would not be a routine, but that you would, if it is, that you would, you would break that up today. That you would break that up today. That, that this would, even if they came out of routine, praise God, they, they, they're here. But would you meet them and transform hearts and minds, God, and even as we offer at first service spontaneous baptisms for people to respond and go public immediately like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. We pray for people to know and trust you. So have your way. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say amen. 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 You may be seated. I don't know about you, but I love a good comeback story. Can I see a show of hands of who loves a a good comeback. Come on, I think we got more hands than that. Who loves a good comeback story? Uh, wh whether you are into sports or not, I know if I surveyed the room, not everyone is necessarily a sports fan, but we love sports comebacks, and we love, in particular, personal comeback stories. We, we love different types of comebacks, military comebacks, where it looks like there is certain defeat, but somehow an army that does not look like they can win is able to gain victory, and we love seeing comebacks like that. Business comebacks, where if you are into business, you could read about uh, businesses that were on the brink of bankruptcy or even filed for bankruptcy, and they were able to bounce back. Sports comebacks, I got to be honest, that's my favorite. I, I can remember I was alive and witnessed Tracy McGrady making 12 points in just a few seconds for Houston to secure a victory. 
I, I was able to watch on YouTube Kendall Ellis uh, for USC to close that fourth leg behind by 30 meters in over 30 meters in third place and to run her leg in 50.05 seconds to be able to come back. I was able to read about the guy who created Dyson who had 5,000 failed attempts before he was able to get the one that secured him victory. I was able to witness the Minnesota Vikings uh, come back, and even though that's not my team, uh, they were able to overcome the largest deficit in NFL history. But then there are relational comebacks where you can read or hear a story or you could watch something about someone bouncing back from an abusive or even a toxic relationship. And we love hearing those comeback stories. But let's make it personal. We love personal comebacks. Uh, how many of you saw The Pursuit of Happiness? Anybody seen that movie? We love that personal comeback of Will Smith playing the true life character of Chris Gardner who experienced heartache and experienced pain and was able to bounce back and have his own multi-million dollar business. While every comeback is informative and inspirational and impactful, uh, th these comebacks are primarily individual. You know, McGrady was able to come back an eight-point deficit in 41 seconds. Kendall Ellis, she was able to overcome the deficit of a fumbled baton and being behind over 30 meters. Minnesota Vikings were able to overcome a 31, 33-point deficit, and Chris Gardner was able to overcome heartache, rejection, failure, letdown, depression in order to have his great comeback in the business sector. And while all those comebacks are amazing, all those comebacks should be celebrated, all those comebacks honor and deserve recognition, the greatest comeback. The greatest comeback of all time is a 33-year-old Middle Eastern man defeating death, hell, and the sin, and the grave. That's what we are celebrating today, the greatest comeback of all time. Over, over several hundred years before this happened, Isaiah made this prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, he said this, he, personifying this, he will destroy death how long? Forever. The Lord God will wipe away tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth. And for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah made a prophecy that death would be destroyed. Isaiah made a prophecy that death would die. And there are four things we need to recognize about this. Number one is that there is the possibility of resurrection. He's prophesying that the Messiah will come and Jesus will defeat death because he will resurrect. But then the second promise in this prophecy is that there will be an opportunity for you and I to experience redemption. Say redemption. Redemption means to buy back. It means to, to pay something. And so there's a resurrection. There's a redemption. The third promise of that prophecy is there that those that are in the, in the life of this Messiah will receive a reward. What's that reward? That we get to live forever because our Messiah has secured our victory. But then there's the fourth one that I love of this prophecy here. Hundreds of years before Jesus would come and walk and live a 33-year perfect life, that there will be a renewal. There's a promise of this glorified body. There's a promise that this decaying body will experience an eternal resurrection because our Savior will resurrect and defeat death, hell, and the grave. And this is what Paul talks about. In 1 Corinthians 15. See, 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul looking back to this prophecy. Paul is looking back and he's saying that what Jesus said, what was declared about him took place. And so there are four aspects of 1 Corinthians 15. First, there's the conundrum. Uh, there are people doubting that resurrection can happen. The second is the confrontation. Paul confronts those that want to doubt the beautiful reality of the resurrection. The third, he gives counsel of the beautiful reality of the resurrection and how that applies to our life. But then he ends with my favorite part, verses 50 through 58, the comeback. Say comeback. comeback. Uh, the, the comeback of our Savior and the details of that. But we're going to work our way there. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 through 14 says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Here's our first point on this Resurrection Sunday. The resurrection secures our restoration. 
Let me say that again. The resurrection secures our restoration. Paul is responding to this, this ridicule. Some people are saying that, that there is no resurrection of the dead, or some in this text are compartmentalizing that, that they believe that Jesus can resurrect, but they don't believe that they will resurrect. And so what Paul is doing here is he is responding to them, and he wants them to know the futility of their conclusion that, that if there is no resurrection, that if Jesus did not defeat death, hell, sin, and the grave, if we are not secured by that resurrection, he has given us four points in that little section that makes this day so pivotal and so important and why we make such a big deal out of it. Because he later on says that if there is no resurrection, we are believing in vain. And so there are four points for number one, if there is no resurrection of the dead, preaching is pointless. I wasted all my time reading them commentaries, preparing for the day. I wasted my time, hours praying and, and, and laying prostrate, getting prepared. If, if there is no resurrection of the dead, preaching is pointless. Number two, witnessing is a waste. You're wasting your time witnessing about a Savior whose body can be found. There's no point in sharing the gospel because you'd be sharing the gospel about a liar. The third thing, forgiveness would be fleeting. If there's no resurrection of the dead, the resurrection secures our forgiveness. Because without the resurrection, we are still in our sin because he had to defeat sin by resurrecting. So our preaching would be pointless. Our, our, our witnessing would be a waste. Our forgiveness would be fleeting. But here's number four, that if there's no resurrection, our reunions would be rejected. I just shared with you guys, I recently lost my grandmother. Thank God she's a believer. The beauty of the resurrection is that even though I cannot hold my grandmother's hands now, and I cannot kiss her on her head. And I cannot no longer see that gray jerry curl that she never got rid of. <laughs> the beauty of the resurrection is that we will experience an eternal reunion. This is why you need to believe in it. If you've lost someone who believed in Christ, the resurrection promises an eternal family reunion where there are no raisins in a potato salad in heaven. I'm joking. There is an eternal resurrection. But here it is. He says, our faith is useless. But read, let's keep going. Verse 32, the B clause. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Or some of your versions say good character. Verse 34, come to your senses and stop sinning. For some people are ignorant about God. I say this to your shame. Next point, the resurrection provides purpose beyond pleasure and pain. The resurrection provides purpose beyond pleasure and pain. In verses 29 through 31, Paul talked about facing danger every hour. He, he talked about enduring certain persecution, even fighting wild beasts. And so when he gets here, he quotes Isaiah again. He quotes Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13, where he's saying that, that if there's no resurrection of the dead. If Jesus is still in the grave, then go ahead, eat and drink and be merry. Go ahead and do you, for you only live once, but he is pushing back against that. He describes the reckless self-indulgence that we all have given into, but the beauty of the resurrection is no matter how much you could have even tried and been instrumental in destroying your own life, the beautiful thing about Jesus is he can fix those broken pieces. Jesus can step in, and he chose to step in your life to redeem and to rescue you. If there's no resurrection, family, listen, life is just a constant fluctuation of pleasure, pain, repeat. Pleasure, pain, repeat. Pleasure, pain, repeat. And there's no purpose there. But the beautiful thing is, is I love this because, see, pleasures provide feelings, but they don't provide fulfillment. Pleasures provide feelings, but they don't provide feel meant. And so he's saying if there's no resurrection of the dead, the void you feel after you get that relationship or you get that position or you get that raise or you get that vehicle or you get that outfit or you get whatever that get is, there's still an empty feeling. But the beautiful thing about the resurrection is because you and I serve a God that loves us before we perform, who loves us regardless of our performance, I have a purpose beyond the pleasure I experience or the pain that I feel. The resurrection gives you life and purpose. The resurrection gives us an eternal hope. But then he moves from the resurrection of the Savior 
to our resurrection. Verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a living, life-giving spirit. Here's our next point. The resurrection provides transformation and triumph. The resurrection provides transformation and triumph. What, what Paul moves on here, he goes on to say, listen, uh, I want to paint a picture for you. And so he uses these agrarian uh, analogies, uh, a lot of times using botanical analogies to communicate his point to his audience. And so he uses the analogy of seeds. And so he goes from agriculture early in the text to animals to astrology. Then he, he ends with Adam. But, but, but I like what he's, shown, he's showing us here. He's saying that when it comes to Jesus, you always get more back than what you give him. Oh, see, that's a shouting moment right there. When it comes to Jesus, you always, he always exceeds our expectations. He always gives us back more than what we deserve. And so what he's saying is, keep in mind, he's talking about the body resurrection here, but he's talking about the glorified body that the resurrection of Jesus makes possible. And because Jesus was fully human and fully God, he's pointing that out that if Jesus in his humanity, remember, he showed Thomas his scars his human body that resurrected. He's saying that when you trust him, it's sown in corruption, but it's reaped incorruptible. It's sown in dishonor. It's reaped in honor. It's sown perishable. It's reaped imperishable because whenever you put in God's hand, when he gives it back, if he gives it back, it's always going to be better. I had the opportunity to speak for my brother in Texas, Pastor Blake Wilson. And they took me to this restaurant called Papa Do's. Yeah. And uh, I'm praying that the spirit will move and they'll get a location here in Raleigh. Yeah. And so I, I, I sat down and he just said, Wash, who was his executive pastor, said, Pastor, you want some, some appetizers? I said, yeah, man, just whatever, whatever y'all get. And he started getting the appetizers. And, and when they brought out the appetizers, I'm not exaggerating, the appetizers covered the whole table. And so I'm, I'm digging in, and, and they tried to get me to eat some gator. I said, no, nah, I'm good on that, but I'm going to get hey, crawfish and all this other stuff. And I started eating, and I'm like, I don't have any room for the main course. <laughs> like, the appetizer is so good. Like, I, this is just too much. And that's what it's like in Jesus. His grace is just too much. His love is just too much. His mercy is just too much. His peace is just too much. He always gives you more than what you deserve. And here's the beautiful thing is that you and I, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is eternal. You and I deserve death, but he gives us life and he gives us peace and he gives us joy and he gives us mercy. Without the resurrection, none of this is possible. And so what he's saying is it was sown one way. But because you were sown and not buried, because if you're in Christ, you're a seed. You were planted, and you're going to bounce back better than how you went into the ground because of your faith in Jesus. We always get more than what we deserve in Christ. But here it is, verse 54. It says, when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory. Here's our last point. The resurrection reminds us that Christ's comeback from the grave is eternal and relational. P please don't miss that beautiful reality that Christ's comeback from the grave is both eternal and relational. Uh, the Bible says that death is swallowed up in victory. But first it says this corruptible body. Now, why are our bodies corruptible? Great question. We go back to Genesis 3. We find out that this is the fall of all mankind. Adam and Eve bring in sin on the world, and they represent the, what we call the federal heads of humanity. And so all of us have to deal with their decision. And so David makes this clear in Psalm 51. He says, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. 
I was sinful when my mother conceived me. So we are born in sin and we are shaped in iniquity. And so we are corruptible. But here it is. David recognized what the Old Testament calls the hesed of God. Hesed is his beautiful love and kindness. In fact, that's the word they used. They had to make up a Hebrew word because they, they could not adequately communicate the beautiful love of Jesus. So hesed is loving kindness. They just threw a couple of words together because his love is so amazing. It's hard to capture in one word. And so hesed is this idea of the loving kindness. And so what, what Paul is doing right now, because in verse 10 of chapter 15, he says, but for the grace of God, I am what I am. And so this is a New Testament version of Paul reflecting on the Hesed because Paul was a murderer who became a minister. Paul was a per persecutor who had a purpose when he found Jesus. Paul recognized that while he was getting papers to persecute more Christians, Jesus interrupted his plans and met him while he was on his way to sin against God. Jesus comes to him personally, knocks him off of that donkey, temporarily takes his, his eyesight, but then gives him a vision. And he says that you are going to be my messenger to both the Jews as well as the Gentiles. Aren't you glad that God interrupted your life? Aren't you glad that God interrupted your plan? Aren't you glad that even when you were not thinking about him, but for the grace of God, I am what I am. Anyone got that testimony? But for the grace of God, I would not be here on this Sunday, but for the grace of God, my marriage would not have made it, but for the grace of God. My mind would be somewhere where I couldn't find it, but for the grace of God. I'm grateful for the grace that Hesed found in the Old Testament is here in the New Testament. And so what Paul is doing here is he's giving this picture of when you trust Jesus, you go from corruptible to incorruptible, from perishable to imperishable, from death to life. He wants them to see their future self now. There's a scene in The Pursuit of Happiness towards the end of the movie where Will Smith is just walking by, and then the real character, Chris Gardner, walks past him. And in the movie sector, they call this a future self-reveal. A future self-reveal is when a character kind of sees their future self. Now, keep in mind, this is biographical, so here it is, Will now seeing the most successful version of himself, walking past him, and this is what Paul is doing in the text. He's saying that the resurrection is not just about your future. I want you to know what he's going to do with your body now, but I need you to see how the future glorified body you have, that resurrection transforms you right now. I want you to get a future vision of who you are in Christ and what he's going to do in and through your life. Here it is. The Spirit's work in the resurrection often gets ignored, but I love what Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 11. It says, and if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the Spirit who lives in you. Th this verse tells us that the, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. And so often we neglect the third member of the Trinity, that, that the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that Spirit lives inside of every blood-washed believer, that you have that resurrection power inside of you. So that should be a reminder when things happen to you, when things hit you, when life be lifing, you need to know of the resurrection power. And this is what he says here in verse 55 to 57. Where death is your victory. Where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's, I love the Bible because he's, he's being real, but he's still giving us hope. Stay with me. He's being real, but he's still giving us hope. He says, he, he presents a rhetorical question, death, where is your sting? But then he lets us know that, that there are some stings in life, aren't there? Come on now, there, there are some stings in life. And so he says the sting of death is the law. He's, he's pointing something because the law can only show you what's wrong with you. The law can only remind you how you will never meet the standard of God. The law can only condemn us. 
The law can only remind you how you keep falling short of the 613 that none of us can ever perfectly keep. But thanks be to God, there's a God who kept the law. And this is why he says, I am the fulfillment of the law in Matthew chapter 5. And so what he's saying here is that, that, that yes, death has a sting. There's a the sting of divorce that some of us have felt. There's the sting of a miscarriage that some of us have had to go through. There's the sting of a diagnosis that we did not want that some of us had to live through. There's the sting of losing loved ones that some of us have experienced. There's the sting of foreclosure that some of us have went through. There's the sting of being a part of a massive layoff. He's saying that life has some stings. But here's the thing. The honeybee only got one move. The honeybee, when the honeybee stings, the honeybee can puncture you. When the honeybee stings, you can feel it. But when the honeybee stings, the body of the honeybee is set in a way that it, the stinger is attached to its abdomen. So when it stings you, it dies. You missed it. So what he's saying is, yes, the death blow stings you, but it won't take you out. Because Jesus, Jesus is the eternal beekeeper. And so the honeybee, death, Satan, hell in the grave, it stings you, but it dies, and you live in eternal victory because death has been swallowed up in victory. Death has been defeated. So you can bounce back. Yes, you feel the sting of the miscarriage, but that does not define you. Yes, you feel the sting of the divorce, but that does not define you. Yes, you feel the hurt and pain of the diagnosis, but that does not define you. Death does not have the final say. Jesus, our Savior, has the final say. So here it is. Matthew 27, all four Gospels record it, but Matthew 27 gives us 66 verses of what our Savior endured, detailing the horrific events. And so if you were to break it up, you see Pilate, you see him being punished, and then you see how he was falsely portrayed. It starts off with Jesus being turned over to Pilate. God was still at work because Pilate's wife said, I've been disheveled and I've had nightmares about this man. I, I've not been able to, to sleep. I, I, I need you to just wash yourself of this, this man. And so Pilate sees Jesus. And during this time, they, they would release one prisoner. And so what happens is they choose Barabbas a murderer over our Savior. They choose a murderer over the Messiah. And they yell out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate then has Jesus flogged before he is then turned over to be the sacrificial lamb for us. I need you to understand and get an 8K view of what happened. The flogging would have ripped off his skin. The flogging would have left him unrecognizable. The flogging would have left him covered in blood. The, the, the flogging would have been worse than the worst beat down you could ever think of. This was before the cross. After being flogged, he now has his cross. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27 that an African man, a Cyrenian man by the name of Simon is called to help him to carry his cross. Our Savior is then put up on the cross in between two thieves. This our Messiah is now in between two thieves, and he goes through all of this for us. There were false witnesses who came to testify against him. They spit in our Savior's face. They put a crown of thorns and said, here lies the king of the Jews. But they said that mockingly. I need you to get a picture, an 8K view of what Jesus went through for me and for you, that Jesus went through all of this because that's how bad our sin is. Our sin is so bad that he did not just fast forward to the cross, but he had to live in our place and say yes for when we say no and say no for when we said yes. He had to live in our place. And here it is. Picture your Savior on the cross, already flogged, already bleeding, already unrecognizable, between two thieves, false prophecies against him, injustice against him. All this Jesus endures for us. And then it ends. Verse 66 of these 66 verses says there were three things in place to try to hold our Savior. There was a stone put there by Joseph for preservation. There was a seal put in place by Pilate for his incarceration. 
And then there was a soldier put in place for domination. And I, I need to stress this, that these three things were in place in an attempt, say attempt, an attempt to keep our Savior in the tomb. An attempt to keep our Savior in the tomb. This is how Matthew chapter 27 ends. Those 66 verses end with a stone, a seal, and a soldier. Oh, but I'm grateful for chapter 28. The angel told the woman, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Verse 6, here it is. He is not here for he has risen. One more time. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. You know, every now and then, I'm happy to find something. I got this little keychain thing in my, in my house when we go through the garage, it's right there on the wall, and I put it up there because I am notorious for misplacing my keys. So then I find myself running around again because I misplaced my keys. Every now and then, I misplace my wallet. So when you misplace something, you're happy when you find it. Every now and then, as much as I use this thing, we misplace our phones. Right? Have you ever seen a teenager misplace their phone? They think they're going to die. You know why? Because they don't want you to find it. So so, so every now and then, I'm happy when I find. But but guess what? There are times when I'm happy when I don't find something. Not to be too graphic, but the older you get in age, you got to have certain procedures. And when they do this procedure, you're happy when they don't find something on your scan. You're happy when they don't find something. If you are in a relationship and they just happen to leave their phone and the spirit told you to check it. (laughs) And you grab the phone and you start looking through, you're happy that you don't find any incriminating text. You're happy that you don't find something. If you are worried about your child and Perhaps the crowd they're hanging around and you're hoping that they're not doing drugs and you wait for them to go and you search through their room because that's your house and that's your room. And you look through stuff, you're happy when you don't find things. Every now and then, you're happy when you don't find something. They found the Cyrus Cylinder proving that that event took place. They found... In 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls that had over 90% of the Bible. They found Confucius' body. They found Muhammad's body. They found Buddha's body. I'm glad that they won't find the body of Jesus. Every now and then, you're glad when you don't find something. I'm glad. I'm glad that they won't find the body of Jesus. I'm glad that the tomb is empty. I'm glad that his body won't be found. The same way I'm glad they didn't find a mask, I'm glad that they won't find my Messiah in the grave because the tomb is empty. Why? Because he has risen. Come on. He has risen. One more time. He has risen. Give him some praise and some glory. I'm glad that they won't find our Savior because the tomb is empty. They had a warning, 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. Here, you got an opportunity to respond. Here, here it is, family. We're going to pray. And we got the baptism pool ready. We, we got to change the clothes and everything for you. So don't even worry about that. Don't worry about your nice dress or your pants or whatever. If the spirit is, is moving on your heart, here's what I want you to think about before we pray. Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell is a world-class violinist. In 2007, listen to me, he did a social experiment where he went to my hometown, Washington, D.C., and he played the violin at LaFont Plaza. He just put on regular clothes. Keep in mind, Joshua Bell is an uh, award-winning violinist, but the social experiment was just to see would people recognize or even stop He was also playing a violin known as a Stradivarius. 
it was over 300 years old. When they did the numbers, out of 1,047 people, only 25 stopped. Many just walked past this award-winning, Grammy-nominated violinist who was playing a violin worth over $14 million. They walked past him. If you are in Christ, the Bible tells us to walk by faith. When you place faith in him, you get to walk by faith. You have a moment to respond to Jesus. What I don't want you to do is to walk by faith. Catch it. If this is faith in Christ, don't walk by it like they did Joshua Bell. Because the Bible says that Jesus was a common-looking man and many did not trust him. They walked by him. And the life of the Savior is worth more than a $14 million violin. But he gave his life for you. Don't miss this moment. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful and thankful that you died and you rose on the third day. Family, while, while, while people are still seated, if you have not trusted Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to trust him now. Every head bow, eye close. This does not have to be another routine Resurrection Sunday for you. This does not have to be another Sunday and another 365 days roll around and, and then you do it again. You can put that routine that's on repeat. You can stop that right now. So if you have not trusted Jesus or you know church but not the gospel, no, church culture is not salvation. Here's your opportunity to trust him now. So right where you are, say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of grace. I'm thankful that you died and you rose for me. It is your faith in Jesus. And I heard a few of you saying that. We pray now that we can rejoice like in Luke 15 with the angels that rejoice over one soul that is saved. Family, we rejoice over those that said that prayer, but that prayer is not what saved them. It's their faith in Christ. So if you feel led while the team is singing, on my left, go to the, the back door and a pastor will be there to walk you through. We are ready to baptize you the same way the Ethiopian unit got baptized right on the spot. We got to change the clothes. That's all worked out for you to get baptized today to celebrate the decision you made today to trust Jesus. Now, family, for some of you, you just needed to be reminded that Jesus' comeback is also yours. I pray that you felt encouraged and empowered by who Jesus is and what he has done. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us all stand. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for being risen and living. He's alive, everybody. Make some noise for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's just think on the greatest gift that God gave us when he gave his only begotten son. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you in spirit and in truth. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still 
and all alone. Come on, how many sing it? Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven, He rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ our King. Yeah, I sing. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Come on, we're gonna sing that together one more time. He shall return. Come on, he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun
great is our God. And all will sing how great, how great is our God. Come on, sing it out. Sing how great, how great is our God. Sing with me. I just want to testify about how, how, how awesome God is, yes, yes. that, you know, we were praying that we, we got 11 baptisms set for a next service, and, and when we were meeting this week, cut it back on, please, thank you, get, get that light, thank you, there we go, all right, they ain't want to hear my testimony, I don't know what's going on. When we were meeting uh, this week and we said, we just felt like the Lord may put it on some people's heart to get baptized first service. And where are we at? We at four, four people, five people getting baptized. Five people getting baptized. Five what we call spontaneous baptisms. Can we give God a hand praise? for saving and baptizing today. Amen? So, so if, if, if you can sit, you can go ahead and sit down because we're trying to zoom in on the camera and all that good stuff. Uh, but God is so awesome. And first is Nevaeh. Nevaeh is coming to get baptized. Let's give her a hand that God moved on her heart. I'm going to read this one time, Romans chapter 6. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. How can he who died continue to sin or still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so, t- so we too may walk in the newness of life. And Nevaeh, let me say, we are celebrating with the angels right now. We are celebrating with the angels. We, we, we want you to know our executive pastor got that, them Walmart sweatpants this week because we knew God was going to move in the midst of the service. And you was going to wear them Walmart sweatpants before the Lord, family, and friends and get baptized today. I ain't know your name, but he did. So, Nevaeh, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Amen. And we recognize that baptism doesn't save, but it is an outward sign of inward transformation. If you lean forward just a little bit, by the power of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Next up is Corinne Holbrooks. A little disciple. Hey. Amen. Praise God. It's okay, Corinne. We we are here with you. We celebrate. Corinne, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? She said, I trust him as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> Amen. We recognize that baptism doesn't save, but it is an outward sign of inward transformation. Amen? Amen. Well, by the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be baptized in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now we have Amir. Amir getting baptized. Let us praise God. Amen. Just move up just a little bit for us, Amir. Amir, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You don't uncover your nose. I got one more question, then, then you can cover your nose. <laughs> it's all right. You realize that baptism doesn't save, but it is an outward sign of inward transformation. By the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. And next is Joseph Lemons, the the fourth. Praise God. Joseph, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You realize that baptism doesn't save, but it is an outward sign of inward transformation. Well, by the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be baptized in Jesus' name. (laughs) Hallelujah! (laughs) Can we praise God for the four souls that got saved and baptized today? And Jesus, you don't have to sit down now. Can we praise God for the four souls that got saved and baptized in Jesus' name? Glory to God. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Sandy to lead us through the Lord's Supper. We're just going to sing really quickly. And lost another one, and I am free. Yes. I am free. Can you declare that this morning? Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. Hell lost another one.
Hell lost another one. Lost four today, amen? Amen. Uh, praise God that the tomb is empty. I, listen, I, I had to say this. I told this to pastor in the bag. Y'all heard that Amber alert, alert go off. The world was on notice that, the, that something was missing this morning. It was the tomb that was empty. <laughs> oh, man. Praise God for the ways he is moving for those spontaneous baptisms. That is a reminder of how the Spirit is moving in this place, and we praise God for that. Amen? Amen. Well, at this time, as we head to the conclusion of today's service, it is a time for the sacrament of communion. And it is a reminder for those who are in Christ, who have uh, committed their life to Christ, for what he has done on our behalf. And we get to celebrate that in a mighty, mighty way today. So as the ushers come forward, I pray that if you are a believer, you have taken this cup, and we'll get to celebrate together here. So if you would take the bread, which represents the body of Christ that was broken for you and for me, which you take and break and eat. And then would you take the juice, which represents the blood of Christ that was shed for you and for me on that cross, which you take and drink in remembrance of him. Mm, oh, so sweet to trust in Jesus. And so let me pray for us this morning as we close, and I have one final announcement. God, we just thank you for the ways in which you continue to move in this place. We thank you that the tomb is empty. And that is a reminder that death does not get the final say. And so, Lord, you are redeeming, much like you did on the cross. You are redeeming situations in each one of our life. And so we praise you for that. We thank you for the ways in which salvation has been on display today. And through the public proclamation of what you are doing in the hearts of those today. And so, God, we just thank you and we praise you so much for what you're doing. We give you the praise and glory. And so as we go from this place, God... Let the gospel be on display through our words and our actions and our lives. And we give you the praise and glory and honor. And we thank you so much for indeed you are risen and you are risen indeed. Amen and amen. Vision Church, before we head out here, please remind um, the visionaries we're going to ask just because we do have one more service today. Praise God. Would you please, uh, you can exit the stage right, just a way to keep the flow. We're going to let the visitors go out back as a chance to, to meet with the pastors, but the doors will be on the side here uh, as a way to exit safely. Remember, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Vision Church, go inspired. Well, listen, I want to personally thank you for worshiping with us virtually here at Vision Church. But I must say this, there's nothing like worshiping with us in person. So if you are in the RDU area, I want you to come and meet some of the greatest people on this side of heaven here at Vision Church. We got a seat, we got a hug, we got a word, and we have it just for you. So we want to invite you to join us. There are several ways you can join us in the mission that God has given us to glorify God, to make disciples. Join us at a worship service. If God is leading you, you can give to the mission as we fund the Great Commission, and we can continue to do the mission that God has given us. Again, thank you for worshiping with us virtually, and I hope to worship with you in person, and I hope to see you soon. God bless you, and I'll see you next week.